This is the story of a fairy tale world on the fringe of Vienna. The whole world was meant to gather here. It's an emperor's ark. And it includes the world's oldest zoo. This magic garden is a statement about nature, needing human hands to reach its fullest beauty. It's the perfect setting for a palm house. The residential splendor unfolding in more than a thousand rooms is beyond dreams and even beyond fairy tales. Beauty requires distance. From time to time, one's possessions should be seen with foreign eyes and described in the words of a visitor. Oh, I'm so sorry to keep you waiting. I was trying to glean some information from this very heavy book. <laughs> and uh, without having done so, I wouldn't have been able to impart the information to you. And information is, of course, the stock in trade of any reputable tour guide, uh, professional or, or the other. Anyway, uh, you want to know what the information is, of course. I'll tell you. Uh, Schönbrunn, as beautiful a summer palace just outside the gates of Vienna that any very important group of people could have wished for themselves. The kind of people that I'm sure you would enjoy ogling from outside through half-closed curtains and so on. <laughs> well, this lot of highly important people have lost innumerable battles throughout history. They have sacrificed an empire. And uh, now, the second piece of information, they've left. Which means, quite simply, that uh, I'm able to invite you to come inside the palace. No, no, ladies and gentlemen, uh, invitations are no longer needed. <laughs> In a fairy tale world, notions like inside and outside are meaningless. A flower bed can be a carpet. The world is my house, the sky is my roof. But then again, the world is not a fairy tale. There's something very real at its core. Power. And everything is there to prove, confirm, and reaffirm this power. Neptune, the Roman god presiding over the great waters, has been pressed into the service of a Catholic dynasty and become a symbol of the empire's sway over the seven seas. Just as the Naiad Nymph stands for the Habsburgs' control over the rivers of their realm. According to legend, the foundation of Schönbrunn was laid by a tiny coincidence. In German, 
the word schön means lovely, and the word brunnen means well. So schön brunn means lovely well. And it was the Emperor Matthias at the very beginning of the 17th century who was on a hunting trip in this region. The whole area was one large hunting preserve. And he and his hounds were surprised to uh, close in on a quarry which turned out to be a spring of bubbling water, fresh and cold. Well, uh, soon this water became famous and it began to earn little tributes like this ornamental fountain head and inside a uh, rather maternal nymph who actually dispenses the invigorating flow. And eventually it spread to such an extent that the palace built here itself and the extensive grounds were all called after, yes, the lovely well. Schönbrunn, a playground of metamorphoses. Nature, its laws and its treasures, serving scientific or even social progress. That notion was foreign to the Baroque era. Nature was seen with a purely aesthetic eye. Her colors, her shapes and fragrances were materials in the artist's hands. Animal behavior. Could it be anything but a metaphor for human coexistence? The sparrow has driven the family of swallows from their nest. For a short while, the proud Habsburgs had to give up their residence, making room for the even greater arrogance of their rather bourgeois opponent, the Emperor of France, crowned by his own hand. Napoleon took up residence in the palace in 1809. Haughty and cynical, he celebrated the Peace of Schönbrunn, but most of all, himself. There is no two-headed animal in nature, but with God and Emperor as co-directors of the political play, such choreographies are, well, useful. In the mid-18th century, Nicolas Pacassi adapted Fischer von Erlach's bold architecture. Children loved to role play. The Empress's children were able to do so in their very own theater. Even someone whose house is the world and whose roof is the sky can appreciate a comfortable interior. An empress had her dream of her personal Garden of Eden fulfilled. The Million Tala Chamber takes its name from its expensive rosewood paneling. It was the stateroom for Maria Theresia's private audiences. The Goblin Chamber now and then, Maria Theresia slept here when the heat of summer was too oppressive in her own bedchamber, as a historic note tells us. It is the very size of Maria Theresia's bed which excites the imagination, especially when it's known that there is historical evidence to show that it was not used entirely for rest. The extraordinarily frank advice of the court physician may account for the astonishingly fruitfulness uh, of a young couple who, in other respects, were often very incompatible. Uh, the advice is in Latin, thank goodness, and uh, I shall now read it to you. <coughs> <coughs> Pretereo senseu vaginem sacratissime majestatis ante coitum diutus esse titillandum. Well, I don't think I have to translate that. Uh, the fact is, she had 16 children, including the hapless Marie Antoinette, and that's no mean score. 
and it shows that even if the relationships between Her Majesty and her consort were at times rocky, they were never for a moment uh, ill-conceived. The Austrians, it has been said, are the Romans among the German-speaking nations, so the Latin tongue comes quite naturally to them. Maria Theresia had 16 children. Subjected to a well-planned strategy of marriage, they would guarantee the prolongation of the dynasty. Vienna and Paris were the rival power centers of Europe. In Paris, everything was politics. In Schönbrunn, everything was metaphor, even the passage of time. The porcelain chamber was where the Empress played, wrote and worked. Here, Maria Theresia enjoyed many a game of chance. The mirror was more than a symbol of vanity. Reason enough to dedicate an entire room to mirrors. That beauty is the radiance of truth, as St. Thomas of Aquinas had written in the Middle Ages, that it must serve a purpose. This is a thought we may be familiar with. The Baroque age held a different view. No doubt the Gloriette is beautiful, and no doubt it lacks a purpose. Meanwhile, at least, it houses a cafe. The Baroque age saw nature as something incomplete, given by God to man to be perfected. Just behind the park, there's a strip of wilderness, pure nature, bare of metaphor. Schönbrunn was to consist of nothing but beauty, and its single purpose was to be a manifestation of power cast in stone. The barn owl mother has made a kill. In a hollow tree, she feeds her young. To regard animal behavior as a simile of human action bespeaks a certain naivety. Yet after a day in Schönbrunn, it's hard to believe that a barn owl in a palace is just like any barn owl in the wild woods. There was absolutely nothing the architects of this fairy tale world treated with indifference. When Nicolas Jadot presented the world's first zoo in 1752, 
he had created an image of his imperial client's mental world. This park was to be a mystical charm, the symbolic center of power. Maria Theresia's husband, Francis Stephen, is said to have been a Freemason. The zoo's overall design is also influenced by some of the concepts of the secret brotherhood. The circle is made up of 12 so-called lodges for animals. The 13th is reserved for man. Never marry an idle man. This was the advice from the Empress Maria Theresia to her lady-in-waiting, and she knew what she was talking about. Her consort, Franz Stefan of Lorraine, uh, freely let his wife run the government, which gave him greater leisure to practice his hobbies, which included, incidentally, extramarital affairs. He showed perhaps a more creative side to his nature when he founded this magnificent Schönbrunn Zoo, which once again gave him the opportunity to study in depth the great affinity which exists between the behavior of animals and men. staged wilderness as demanded by the 21st century. Here, the habitats of animals and humans seem to merge. To the Baroque era, nature was a treasure trove of symbols. To us, it's not. 
we want to see and study it for its own sake. It takes all this to make man-made nature work. The world's oldest menagerie has become one of its most modern zoos. Sweating in the rainforest house is a very real experience and to be suffered when you bring the tropics to our latitudes. The emperor's little bell is still rung every evening when the zoo closes. At night, the area belongs to the animals alone, including those from the surrounding parklands. And none of them worries about mystic symbols, and even less about the place's history. The visitors from the park meet their captive cousins, and they needn't be of the same species. The question who rightfully belongs here and who does not seems quite irrelevant. The zoo is home to all, to the noble exotic residents, as well as the omnivorous locals. The Emperor's Green Treasure Chest. All Habsburg children were compelled to pursue professions more useful than mere aristocracy. And in such surroundings as these, it is in wonder that many of them became gardeners. But even in such humble activities, they rose to the top of the tree, as tradition demanded. Many of them became scientists, agronomists, Treasure hunters on imperial assignment. The Orangery. In the warm months, Mozart and Salieri performed here. In winter, it was the quarters for citrus trees and other warmth-loving plants. The dramaturgy of park and seasons grants little rest to the plants. Everything is always on the move. Maria Theresia's famous myrtle tree, a wedding gift from the Sultan of Constantinople. If this were to die, it would be a disaster. Not all plants grow that old. In fact, most of them last no longer than just one season. 300,000 seedlings are raised every year. In the greenhouses, they form colorful carpets. For a few weeks, each little plant becomes a tiny dot in the great mosaic. And 
then they end up on the compost heap. How short-lived is beauty? A point hard to deny, even without the Baroque obsession for seeing a simile in everything. Then again, there are plants that are not just meant for decoration. They serve to satisfy a collector's passion. They are investments. The Habsburg's green gold. This is the floral aristocracy. No, Phokia crispa is not a Greek actress. It is this 800-year-old plant and it was feared that she was an endangered species. Until suddenly, at 800 years old, she had all these children. <laughs> at my age, I found that very hard to believe. Not only plants are caught up in this universal restlessness, but what do plants do to stay in shape? The garden is an intelligent element of the overall design. It is an exaltation of nature. Baroque life is a never-ending play on a designed stage. Baroque monarchs found every fault with nature. It became only bearable when corrected and subjected to order. On the other hand, what inspired that formal order? Nature, of course. What else? What's Sir Peter thinking? What this summer fairy tale will look like when autumn comes? Autumn with its storms and winter with ice and snow? Even for an emperor of God's grace, the taming of nature has its limits. The Baroque garden will change its colors with the seasons. But if nature changes, at least it should do so under man's direction. Beauty is the radiance of truth. Trees are being cut, that's all. And yet, a ballet, free and above all things.
Yes, it's possible. In fact, it's probable that Franz Schubert, the composer, when he was in a sad mood, loved to visit the summer residence at this time of year, just to walk. Greek and Roman gods and half-gods, sentinels of stone watching over the Catholic dynasty. A paradox, but softened by winter. Francis Joseph was the first emperor who chose to spend the entire year in Schönbrunn. Now it was no longer just a summer residence. The portents of winter were already appearing across the monarchy. Combined effects of lines, colors, light, and shade push illusions to the limit. But in a fairy tale world, is there ever a limit to illusion? To us, the Baroque's claim to absolute beauty may appear as drill and dressage. Today, we like things to be a little out of line. Servant nature, acting the jolly joker before man's arrogance. This is one way of seeing it. And still, it's beautiful. Spring as nature's stage. From this perspective, only swallows have seen the Empress's playground. Is beauty absolute perfection? Or will the appearance of perfection do? In the center of the garden, a wonderful glass palace, a residence befitting the booty of many a botanical excursion. In the mid-18th century, the gardeners of Schönbrunn did more than raise and care for plants. They were scientists and adventurers, treasure seekers in their majesty's service. They were sent on missions all across the world, all the way to the Cape of Good Hope, to conquer the world of plants. From their travels, Nicolas Jacquin, Francis Bos, and all the others brought specimens from a mostly unknown world to the Vienna Palace. A scion of the House of Habsburg, Maximilian by name, was in a way the grey sheep of the family. And he was sent on a trip round the world by them, mainly in order to get rid of him for a while. But his revenge on them was subtle. 
he acquired on his trip so many exotic plants that there was no room for them in the imperial collection. And of course, another solution had to be found. The other solution turned out to be this building. The first and largest on the European continent to be made entirely of iron and glass and entitled the Palm House. And in a sense, this Palm House was a memorial to the unfortunate uh, Maximilian later Emperor of Mexico, who finished his life tragically before a Mexican firing squad. The Palm House is the heritage he left, a glass sarcophagus for eternity filled with living witnesses from all parts of the globe. Back then, it was one of the world's most exciting and comprehensive collections. Glass panes set in a thousand iron frames disperse the light. To all this, the young owls seem indifferent. It's late summer, and they're ready to try their wings. Today, for the first time, they'll leave their hollow tree. What did people say when they met the emperor's carriage? The throne on wheels. In other words, the emperor never leaves his place. Rather, the earth rolls by beneath him. They tell me with a certain pride that nothing has changed in this English riding stables since they were built. But, uh, of course, there are no horses here anymore, and uh, therefore there's no riding. <laughs> and uh, I, looking around, don't see anything particularly British about it. It's become the depot, the overflow, in fact, of the famous carriage museum. And there's every kind of carriage here, horse-drawn ones and uh, sedan chairs and uh, sledges. In fact, every precursor of the modern horseless carriage. An absolutely royal pram for Napoleon's son. Marie-Louise, daughter of Emperor Francis I, was married off to the executor of the French Revolution, a purely political deal. In 1811, she bore a son to the French emperor. As the product of this union, all he could do was witness his father's eventual downfall. At the age of 21, the Duke of Reichstadt died of tuberculosis. The funeral carriage. For an entire era, it carried the deceased Habsburgs to their final rest in the Capucin tombs. Napoleon's own carriage, built in 1805 on the occasion of his coronation as King of Italy. It was greatly admired at the Austrian court. The strict and worldly Frenchman would not have been amused had he witnessed how a fairy tale princess rode to her wedding in his carriage. The dream couple of an era, Emperor Francis and Princess Sisi. The reformations expected of the young emperor never materialized. The emperor Franz Josef was an arch conservative, opposed to change of any kind, and even at a time when the world was rapidly changing. 
His main anathema was the gramophone. Oh, and the motor car. And a little bit later, also, the telephone, which he absolutely abhorred, believing that nothing could really replace a conversation man to man. In fact, Schoenbrunn never got electric currents until the turn of the century. And the man who put them there was none other than the famous Thomas Edison, inventor of the light bulb. Thank you, Thomas. The emperor, by the way, refused to pay Edison. The bill had to be settled by the city of Vienna. With Emperor Francis Joseph, a chill settled on Schönbrunn. The crises of the monarchy became acute. There remained little hope for either his marriage or the vanishing glory of the multinational state. The emperor tried at least to keep up appearances. Sisi rarely stayed in Vienna. She was without quiet, traveling from one place to another. And when she visited Schönbrunn, she avoided the palace. The palace's dairy farm became her refuge. She was shy and restless, untamable. In this place, too, she remained a stranger. The monarchy had come full circle. Shaken by national, social, and political conflicts, the huge empire began to crumble. Emperor Francis Joseph is the tragic hero in the final act. I am spared nothing, he once remarked, and it was true. His brother Maximilian was executed. His son Rudolf committed suicide. Elizabeth was stabbed to death. And finally, there was Sarajevo, triggering the First World War. On November the 21st, 1916, around nine in the evening, the monarch passed away. Schönbrunn is now a ruler's seat without a ruler. In 1918, after three centuries, the Habsburg family has to leave their palace. Later, their country, Europe, the world, will never be the same again. Schönbrunn was no longer the center of power, yet it retained the power to reflect the new era.
Today, the Habsburgs' palace is open to all. A source of beauty, the beauty of past ages. This beauty undoubtedly is not eternal, but something can be done to extend its life. An army of restorators is working hard to make the glory last. Artists and craftsmen not working on metaphors, their work is metaphorical. Thus, the palace remains an open window into the past, tediously, artfully, lovingly cared for. Beyond the tourist crowds, Schönbrunn remains a secret labyrinth, with many a passage known only to long-time inhabitants. In a fairy tale palace, can there be anything even close to everyday life? There are more than 1,000 rooms, and some are private. It's hard to believe, but these apartments, boasting Vienna's loveliest views, are the homes of normal people. Apartments for rent. For centuries, Schönbrunn was a grand stage for the dramas of the world. Tragic political pieces were performed here, and bitterly serious comedies. And what of Schönbrunn itself? Well, it was built as an elegant summer residence for emperors at a time when arrogance was still in fashion. And then it was associated with the Congress of Vienna, an alliance which attempted to curb successfully an other greater arrogance, that of Napoleon. And finally, in 1955, they celebrated here with a great banquet, the rebirth of the Republic of Austria after two disastrous wars. Today, Schönbrunn is open to all, to tourists, to students, to dreamers, even to the mass of exhausted joggers in the park. And um, there are so many stories still to tell. <laughs>